Faith family, uh, Pastor Chad here on what we call Good Friday. And I hope you're doing well. I've been praying for you guys, been thinking about you guys. I know these have been difficult times being apart. Over the last few days, we've been walking through the Passion Week. We started in the triumphal entry. We talked a little bit about Jesus um, and how he cursed the fig tree that following day, cleansing the temple. We, we talked about the different stories that he, and time that he spent with his disciples in those last few days. Yesterday, we talked a little bit, while there's a lot going on, we talked about Jesus when he washed the feet of the disciples and that display of love, of, of humility, but also a display of their need for him to cleanse them. That today we arrive at Good Friday. You know, it's one of those names that, well, honestly, it seems, it doesn't seem fitting at first because this is a day in which we remember or we recognize death. And so a lot of times we don't associate, we don't think of that as being good, right? I mean, I, I think of almost like that, that shopping day after Thanksgiving, you know, it's called Black Friday, right? And like, maybe those should be flip flop. <laughs> like, maybe this should be Black Friday and that should be like Good Friday or something like that. Like, you know, that's because that seems like it would fit better. But that's not the case. Like, this is Good Friday for a reason. Now, let's catch up a little bit on this story. You know, our faith, the, the, or the Passion Week, you know, Jesus has had the Last Supper with the disciples. He's obviously already washed the disciples' feet. He's, he's gone into the Garden of Gethsemane. He spent time in prayer with the Lord. He's been betrayed by, by Judas, and, he, and Judas has sold him. He's already been taken. He's already been arrested. Jesus has gone through three different trials, if you really want to call it trials. Mock trial might be the best name for it. And ultimately, Pilate could find nothing wrong, that nothing that Jesus had committed, especially worthy of, of death. And so Pilate gives the people an opportunity. He gives them a choice. Uh, they, could, they, they could free an individual, and they had two choices. One was Jesus of Nazareth, who, who went on trial, and they could find nothing wrong. And there was Barabbas, who was, well, he was known for being a criminal. Yet the people chose to crucify Jesus. You see, Sunday we celebrated um, a parade of celebration, a parade where the, the people there shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? Like, save me, save me. Now the tide has changed, and rather than cheers of Hosanna, came shouts of crucify him, crucify him. Jesus endured those mock trials, and he also endured humiliation. He endured the, the laughter of people, of the crowds, of the soldiers. He endured like physical beatings. The cat of nine tails, the whip in which Jesus would have been kind of hunched over and his flesh completely bare. And that, that whip that would have had like nine tails on it and, and those, those leather pieces would have been interwoven with like rock or glass or, or sharp objects. And so as the trained Roman soldiers would whip them, and as they yanked back, that, that whip would wrap around and then we would come through and it would literally rip pieces of flesh off. And after enduring that, well, then they continue to mock him. They were calling him king. <laughs> they, they took and found something like this. Although this is a really poor representation of 
I'm sure what his crown really looked like. But it would have been a crown of thorns. Those thorns probably two inches or better. And they wouldn't just gently lay it on his head. No, they would press it. Press it to where it began to puncture the skin. It would cause him to further bleed. He would have to carry his own cross outside of town to a place called Golgotha where the crucifixion would take place. Once he finally got there with some assistance, rather than tie him to a cross, the Bible tells us they nailed him to a cross. Now, we're not just talking little nails. I think just a regular nail going through our skin, like, it would hurt. I mean, incredibly hurt. Now, these, these nails probably were more like spikes similar to this. Spikes that would have been piercing at his wrists. We use this cross, most of you might remember it, recognize it. We use this cross on our Easter's. In the same field that I'm at today, or after church, we, we often come out for an Easter egg hunt. We have the cross out there, little ferns around it with a white piece of cloth, and oftentimes families will take pictures around it. Again, the cross would look much different. But after Jesus would have been nailed to a cross, they would have thrust it up. They would have dropped into its hole. And as it dropped, it would have been jarring to Jesus. And Jesus hung on that cross. The taunt continued. The difficulty, the pain would intensify. You see, every time he would have to breathe, he couldn't just inhale like we normally do. He'd, he'd literally have to begin to lift himself up. Think, think through that. Like his body is being hung by nails between his hands and his feet. And so every time he goes to, to take a breath, he has to push up with his feet and his hands like this and more, more weight, more pressure on those nails. just to breathe. I love how when you read the book of John, John chapter 19, it records Jesus' last words on the cross. John chapter 19, verse 30. says, And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Listen, we misinterpret this. We misread this. If we think that this is a sigh of defeat. Honestly, I think we misinterpret this if we think of it in any way other than Jesus victoriously saying, it is finished. In that Greek, that ancient Greek, it would have been one word, to telestai. Just think through this. Jesus, in that last breath, lifting himself up, taking a breath and victoriously saying, to tell us that it is finished. Folks, it's Good Friday because it is finished. You might be thinking, like, what, what's, what's finished? Jesus' task was to leave heaven and come to earth. He was, he was to be here, to live amongst us, and to be the perfect sacrifice, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. 
to live a blameless, perfect life with no sin, nothing, never doing anything wrong. And then be an atonement or, or, or a payment for us. So Jesus, in his grace, in his mercy, in his love, as a way of redemption, took all that upon us. See, when Jesus uttered those words, it is finished, it means that, that God had already placed the burden of all of man's sin, every sin that had been committed and every sin that would be committed had bore it upon Jesus' shoulders. And Jesus had to take that anguish, take that pain, take that punishment. And so when Jesus utters to tell us that it is finished, it is victory, it is Jesus saying he has done it, he has taken it. Listen, we can't tell this story about Jesus dying on the cross without going to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5. I love verse 6. It says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Guys, that's, that's me. That's you. At just the right time. When we're still weak. Remember, like it's, a, it's this understanding that, that God didn't wait for everyone to figure it out. The disciples didn't understand what was going on. They had betrayed him. His closest friends. No, listen. When we're still weak, when we're still sinners, you go two verses down. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Good Friday Easter, understand that this was what God did for us. Listen, right now, I understand there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of fear. There's a, a lot of uncertainty. A, a lot of us are sitting back thinking about all the different struggles that we're going through. There's a lot of, of people that are, are worried about what's going to happen to their finances What's going to happen to their businesses? What's going to happen to their jobs? What's going to happen to the health of, of, of themselves, of their children, of their loved ones? There's a, a lot of probably pinned up like frustration of, of being in close corners with very little escape. Like I understand that there's a lot going on. And there's a lot of things that we're thinking through about how bad and how miserable we might be. But folks, don't lose sight of what this day means, of what Jesus Christ did for me and for you. He loves you. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, God gave his only son, Jesus, that whosoever, that means anyone. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how good you might be or how bad you might be. Doesn't matter how rich you may be or how poor you might be. Doesn't matter if you're sick or healthy. Doesn't matter what skin color you are. Doesn't matter what, what country or what continent you were born on. Doesn't matter if you're pretty or maybe not so pretty. None of it matters. That whosoever believes in him, Jesus, will not perish, will not spend eternity in hell, but have everlasting life. My prayer 
for you this Good Friday. As difficult as things may seem, is to step back, is to remind yourself of the story, to remind yourself of what Jesus went through. Grab your Bibles. Start in John chapter 13 and keep going. Read through chapter 20. Be reminded of all the things that Jesus endured and understand it. He did it because he loved you and me. And if he loved us enough to endure all that this represents, He's still in control. I hope that the story of Good Friday encourages you. Honestly, I hope the story of Good Friday convicts you. And I, when I say convict, like challenges you. Whether you believe in Jesus, whether you have a relationship with Christ, whether you're what we consider a Christian or not, for those of you who have already given your life to Christ, who are believers, have you gotten off course? Have you allowed all these other things to become distractions? Have you allowed all these, as, as we've had to go through now several days, weeks, are you being more and more reminded of things that have become gods in your life? Things that you don't think you can live without? Some of us are more concerned about those things than our relationship with Jesus. Man. Spend some time praying and being with him. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to understand this. Jesus said it is finished. He bore your sins. And he's offered you a free gift. A free gift of salvation. All you need to do is admit that you are a sinner and that you need a Savior. To, to believe that Jesus Christ was God's Son and that he, he left heaven, he came to earth, and that he died on the cross for your sins. And ask him, pray to him, just simply say, Lord, please come into my life and be my Savior. If you do that, well, then this Friday is a good Friday. I love you guys. I can't wait to see you.